Hello. Thank you for joining us today for the EarthX sponsored world status briefing. Uh, EarthX uh, is the exercise sponsored by the Electric Infrastructure Security Council. Most of you all have already registered for EarthX. Uh, if you didn't know, this will be our fifth year uh, that we put on EarthX. Uh, last year we had registrations in 41 different countries or 21 different 41 different countries, uh, over 12,000 participants, and we're already on track to, to meet those numbers this year. But we do want to thank you for making time to uh, spend a little bit of time with us as in our final uh, event in the EarthX training series. We've had three additional events: one on fire resilience, one on flood resilience, and then one just a few weeks ago on community resilience. And this is, as I mentioned, the world status briefing. Are you ready uh, for EarthX? So let's jump into it. Lots to talk about, but we thank you for joining us. We started putting this briefing together actually several months ago, and, and just in the course of the last uh, week or so, we decided to narrow our focus simply because of the wealth of material that's out there that's very current to pick from to, to make the cases that we want to make to get you ready to play EarthX and to really have a good fundamental understanding what it is we're, we're trying to accomplish with this year's exercise. So if you'll notice on the screen, and I promise to try to not read slides to you, I'm not a big fan of that. Um, you'll notice that today we're gonna talk about uh, the thing that uh, we can't ignore the pandemic. We're gonna talk about climate change, how climate change manifests itself in our, our current world, fires and floods, the two themes for EarthX this year, and then a host of other activities that are and events that are ongoing. Uh, ultimately, we're gonna culminate this into uh, what I hope is, is a bit of optimism at the end. And then we'll spend a few minutes talking about EarthX and uh, what you can look forward to when we, when we let EarthX uh, out into the real world uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, my name is John Heltzel. I'm the Director for Resilience Planning for the Council. And again, it's been a pleasure to be part of uh, the EarthX team for the last five years and we greatly appreciate your, your participation. So let's just jump right into this. I'm gonna go fairly quickly. Uh, we will be sending out copies of the slides. Uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to use the questions pane. However, I probably will not try to answer them live. We will send you an email response. And if we think the question is something that everybody might want the answer to, we'll put that into a, a one last communications that will come out later today. So let's just jump right into this. Uh, the elephant in the room, the worldwide room, of course, is the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this pandemic has, has taken the modern world in a way that, that many of us who had planned for pandemics didn't see anything lasting quite this long or being quite this virulent. Uh, it's very unfortunate to talk about the pandemic today. Uh, a year ago, we were, we were touting that EarthX was maybe the safest exercise you could do and that next year you'd be able to go into your office and conduct your exercise in person. Uh, not sure how many people are gonna be able to do that again this year with the rise of the Delta variant. And then if you haven't been uh, monitoring the news lately, we've got a new variant coming out of South Africa. It's what they call a, a variant of concern. Uh, the medical community is looking at this very hard, uh, but it, uh, just, just recently on the news, in fact, just a few minutes ago, uh, Delta is the, is the course of the day that we've got to be concerned with. And the number of infections continues to grow worldwide. And it's interesting if you look at the list of countries that are on there, two of the most vaccinated countries in the world are on that list with the largest growth. So clearly we're not at the end of this process by any stretch of the imagination. So everything we talk about in terms of emergency preparedness and EarthX has to be done through a lens that keeps COVID in our mind. The numbers on this chart are staggering, they're disturbing, they're cause for great concern. Um, it is something that we've all got to take seriously. And I just encourage everybody to follow medical science, do all that you can, not the minimum, but do all that you can to remain safe and well and be part of your community's ability to uh, respond and restore from the disasters that we're gonna talk about today. So COVID, uh, one of the things that is driving our medical community to, do, to new heights, uh, but it's also taking a tremendous toll and uh, in my book, uh, our medical community workers uh, are definitely the heroes of this event. 
uh, but we need to get them some release uh, relief. So please uh, mask up, uh, get your get your vaccination if you have it, get your booster if you have it, and watch your social distancing and uh, take care of each other. So the theme for EarthX this year is two major two major threats: uh, uh, fires and floods. And the fires and floods that we're talking about are climate change driven events. Uh, just this in the last month or so, we've got the release of the uh, the newest climate change report out of the UN. And to be honest, this one really pulls no punches. Uh, a lot of the information that's contained in this report is things that those of us that have been uh, in the preparedness business have been looking at for a number of years, but really it kind of ends the debate about whether there is an event going on or not. If you find somebody that wants to argue about climate change at this point, it's probably best to just turn and walk away from that person. You're not likely gonna be able to change their mind uh, the, the picture that I use for this particular slide, I find extremely disturbing, but also somewhat eerily beautiful. Uh, we've got moose in the river, the, the only place they can think of to escape that fire. But as we've seen out in the West, um, all over the, nor the West of the United States, there really is no escape for some of the wildfires that are coming our way. And we have got to be prepared for these events. When you start looking at these events, uh, when you dig into what's actually in the report, what we're seeing is that we're warming faster than we predicted even 20 years ago. Uh, there is still a window to make a difference in how things might turn out, but that window is, is shrinking as we speak. Uh, we've got to take immediate action. And we'll talk about some of the actions that are, that are ongoing that, that we, can, we can try to support. But what's interesting about this report, if you haven't had a chance to read it as, as opposed to previous reports and even some congressional studies that were done, they talked about uh, extrapolation of data to say that things are going to happen. What's in this report is these are things that we can observe and have observed and they're happening now. Uh, kind of down there at the bottom, recently released greenhouse gas levels are the highest that they've ever seen ever going back using ice core sampling more than 800,000 years ago. So when people say, well, it's warmed up in the past, it hasn't warmed up in the past like anything that uh, that we have a modern record of. Uh, this is something to absolutely be fearful of, and we've got to take action. We've got to put our best minds to it. And then we all have to make the decision that we want to survive. Uh, the threats that we're looking at out of climate change will definitely put us into a black sky scenario. One of the major issues that we're worried about in this particular environment is what's going to happen to all areas of the world. If you think about Madagascar, it's basically an area that has very little industrialization. Uh, its economies are, are driven fairly rurally. Um, the population is definitely not the population that may be causing these problems, but they are going to be the ones that suffer from it initially uh, and maybe the most disturbingly. We are looking at drought across wide regions. We'll talk about drought coming up. We're talking about food insecurity. We're, we're talking about the, the level of impact on populations where that population may cease to exist. Uh, we literally do not have solutions in place to try to solve a repopulation of large portions of Africa. So we've got to think about now, what can we do to change this outcome as quickly as we possibly can? I'm going to talk about a few things in this presentation today that, that seem to be duplicitous or opposite sides of the same coin or outliers. And this is one of them. I found this research, I found this during my research. Uh, a very noted uh, scientist came back and made the statement that what we saw this year in Canada was statistically impossible. Um, it should not have happened, um, but it still did. If you're familiar earlier this year, we were seeing in the Northwest of the US, temperatures reaching 108 degrees in late spring uh, in Seattle. But what we saw in British Columbia was 121 degrees. I actually happened to be on the phone with a very nice individual uh, from our Canadian partners in Ontario. Uh, and, and this particular leader was, was sharing with me that they lived off the coast. They only had one, one fan in the house. They did not have air conditioning and yet the house had gotten up to these kind of temperatures. While these things sometimes occur, what we're seeing now is that they're happening more and more often. 
And that rare high point, it was at one time a historic precedence, say for example, a thousand year flood, we're starting to see those in repetitive years. That tells you that things have changed in a way that we have got to change to head off the direction that they seem to be indicating. So again, statistically impossible, maybe not so much anymore. One of the things, if you're familiar with the uh, Electric Infrastructure Security Council, we're involved in very much cross-sector planning and resilience. And we're, we take a look at all forms of infrastructure. This particular headline grabbed my attention because it talks about uh, climate change is gonna bring heavier storms and our sewers aren't ready. I would put forward that it's not only our sewers, but it's all forms of our infrastructure. We've not, in, we've not engineered our infrastructure to be able to handle the amount of water that's going to come down that we've got to, to deal with, but also the amount of uh, climate issues that are being driven, both heat and cold, that are going to cause problems for the way we've engineered all forms of infrastructure. You only have to go back to what we're now calling the polar vortex in Texas to realize that uh, the engineering capability to withstand that drop in temperature has been around for many, many years. We have to take the steps to make sure that we do it. When we start talking about overflows of water, much like we're seeing in, uh, in uh, Louisiana and Mississippi through the hurricane, and we'll talk about that, we realize now that the, the pathogens that can be released through these sewage spills have the ability to change all forms of our ecosystems. So we've got to find solutions for these, and we've got to begin the engineering and reinvestment now. And we'll talk about some of the reinvestment opportunities that, in, in, that I'm, I'm very optimistic about that we finally had some great dialogue about. Probably the one thing, and I'm going to spend a bit of time on this since it is the, the, the focal point of EarthX this year, literally is the, the number of wildfires that we're seeing around the, the, not only the United States, but the world. But if you look at this headline, the two wild, largest wildfires have burned more landmass area than if you combine New York City, Los Angeles, and Chicago. I want you to think about it in your, in, in your mind. If you're not familiar about with just how big Los Angeles County actually is, go grab yourself a Google map and, and spin the wheel backwards and zoom out and find out just how much area we're talking about. The Dixie Wild, the Dixie Wildfire has, has scorched over 240,000 acres. It, it, it has threatened tens of thousands of buildings. It's forced evacuations in many places. If you go north up to Southern Oregon, you've got the bootleg fire that has done, uh, it burned 413,000 acres. Uh, and we're gonna talk more about some of these destructive, uh, the destructive uh, wildfires that are going on to kind of give you a sense of, this is not typical, this is not normal. This is not the wildfires of old. Um, the two things I want you to come out of this briefing with today are the events that we're going to talk about and introduce to you during EarthX are not events of the future. Depending on where you're located, they're events of the present. So now is the time to use this information and improve ourselves. Uh, I pulled this particular picture forward because if, you'll, if you can see it clearly, those are fairly large houseboats that were once on a major lake, the lake not that long ago. Uh, was at the top of those brown areas. And uh, the lake is now down to that, that small area and the boats are getting closer and closer together. Uh, just a terrible, terrible situation on Lake Oroville. This may have been one of the more disturbing slides that I put together for this because even with as much research as I've been doing on wildfires over the last year to, to put together EarthX for, for 21, uh, some of these numbers were quite startling to me. The picture at the top is actually firefighters in Russia. Um, and Russia is dealing with a level of fire that uh, maybe 20 years ago, people would have told you could not happen. Uh, when we think about Siberia, at least mentally in my mind, uh, I knew there was permafrost, I knew there was some great forests, but I always thought of it as cold and very, very green. What's happened in just the last year is Siberia's wildfires are bigger than all the other world's blazes if you combine them. Over 6 million acres have been destroyed. We also see fires occurring across the uh, European Union uh, footprint. 
uh, Sardinia for, for one example. I know the first, when I first joined the EIS Council and we were having conversations with our European Union uh, uh, partners, um, their interest in wildfires was not very great. I will tell you in the last year, they've reached out to me several times to talk about sharing some of the techniques and some of the tactics that we're pulling together for fighting wildfires. Uh, the world is simply drying out. And I'll show you some pictures from Greece coming up in a minute. Uh, we talked a little bit about Canada. I've got another slide on Canada, but these wildfires are something to be feared. And if you're in the mindset that, well, I live in the Eastern part of the United States, or I live in a place that's very, very green, so we're, we can't have wildfires, uh, shoot, me, shoot me your name and we will get you some statistics on just how close you could have, how close and how real wildfires could be and have been to your area in the past. Uh, really, um, there's very few places left in the world that aren't at some level of risk from uncontrolled wildfires. Greece is one of those places that just a decade or so ago, people would have said, no, no, Greece uh, has been around forever, literally the, uh, the cradle of modern civilization, the home of some of our, uh, all of our shared history. Greece has seen all this before and uh, Greece is not gonna burn. They, you know, it's never burned before, it's not gonna burn again. These four pictures on this slide have all occurred in the last uh, 120 days. When you can burn the lounge chairs around a pool, uh, there's no place that can escape this. And the issue is that one of the things that's most disturbing, we talk about the Greece and its history to mankind, its importance to mankind. The picture in the lower left-hand corner is one of these uh, major uh, human uh, artifacts that has burned. That is a burned out uh, piece of Greece history, uh, human history. It is no longer capable. It's going to have to be demolished. It can't be rebuilt. Um, so fires are everywhere. And then these two I pulled off of, these are, these are not things from the spring. These are things within the last 30 days. And the headline was that uh, this is a disaster of unprecedented proportions. And you see the gentleman through the haze there trying to beat back the wildfire headed towards his house. But the picture at the bottom is ju just breaks your heart. Uh, that very nice older woman is, is just distraught because right behind her house, the entire hillside is going up in flames. Don't know what happened there, but that is a heartbreaking picture. And then I turned my lens to, uh, to my friends in California, and I've got family and coworkers and a number of friends that, that are in uh, daily fights uh, with the California wildfires. We mentioned the Dixie wildfire earlier. I pulled this uh, last night directly uh, from uh, the local news media there. Uh, these are active fires that are going on all across uh, California and the, and the Southwest and the Northwest. Just a tremendous number of fires which require a tremendous number of resources. And uh, as my partner will tell you, uh, Mr. Ranger Dorn, who's a, who's a uh, retired fire battalion chief, you can have all the resources in the world and it does not mean you're gonna be able to protect all the structures. Sometimes evacuation is the only thing that you can do. And unfortunately, we're seeing some of that today. The Dixie Fire, uh, latest information, over 771,000 acres burned. It is continuing to burn. It is only 48% contained. And that's with every resource that CAL FIRE can put on it. And then we, we, we roll over to today's uh, fire of the day. Unfortunately, it's not just one day, the Caldor Fire. 177,000 acres burned as of today or as of last night. When I logged on this morning, it had burned another 20,000 acres overnight. Uh, used to be you could count on fires not, not continuing to grow exponentially at night. That is no longer the case with the fuel that's on the ground. This one's been going for 16 days. It is only 14%. And starting last night, uh, they ordered mandatory evacuations uh, to try to save as many people as they can. Uh, this fire is up around uh, the Lake Tahoe area. Uh, tremendous natural and national resources in that area. Uh, the most we can hope for is to minimize the loss of life, uh, but this fire is not going to be put out anytime soon. So when we talk about fires and we talk about EarthX, and what we want you to understand is this is the new normal, and I'm not a big fan of that term, new normal. It came 
I started hearing a lot about it in the pandemic. Uh, I'm, I'm a denier. I don't want the pandemic to ever become the new normal, although I think it is something we're going to have to live with for quite a while. But the new normal from this standpoint is you can have these kind of uncontrolled wildfires anywhere, anytime. And if that is truly the case, then we've got to think about what do we do to get our communities and the individuals in our communities to take personal responsibility so that they can deal with these climate change driven disasters. And there's just a few things on this slide that are worth calling out. We've got to conserve water to be able to fight the drought uh, as it occurs. Places that have never had to invest in air conditioning to maintain quality of life are gonna have to do that. Um, the odds are Canada and British Columbia has not seen their last heat wave. Um, and then, you know, the bottom line that, that has proven to be somewhat successful is this idea of clearing vegetation away from your buildings, knowing that you've got a fire break and that you maintain that fire break. Some of the issues we're struggling with nationally and internationally is um, most of our insurance regulations haven't kept up to date with how do we do this and how do we pay for it and how do we share that burden? Some of the things that homeowners have to take advantage of and have to take into consideration is that uh, this is not gonna be easy to do. And if you're counting on someone from the government to come in and tell you, you have to do it, that's probably putting yourself at the end of a line. It's, it's not gonna be successful in the near future. There are laws on the books, especially in the, uh, in the West of the United States that mandate these kind of inspections, but there aren't enough people to actually get the job done to the level that it needs to. So people have to take it upon themselves. And then ultimately, uh, people have to make sure that they've got the, the fireproofing uh, uh, requirements uh, well understood, well in hand, and are doing all they can to protect themselves. There's no easy way out for this one. We've talked about Canada several times. I built this slide for a, a briefing that I gave to the Ontario Association of Emergency Managers uh, back in early July. Great organization, really pushing EarthX uh, uh, quite well in, in uh Ontario, I'm, I'm hopefully they're very they're going to be very successful in getting the word out. But more than 180 wildfires, uh, and then uh, so many dead out of this heat wave. When we start talking about the things that can happen, one of the things that's going on around the world is that we've allowed people to live in in some unusual places. Uh, people are because of the cost of property, because the the um, the, the limited high quality real estate that's out there. People, when they move, they're moving into some very dangerous locations. Places that uh, hydrologists will tell you are likely to flood or are likely to burn. And we've got to do better as community uh, managers and community uh, uh, emergency management people uh, to make sure that we're, we're having the right kind of dialogues to protect as many people as we can from moving into flood zones moving into fire zones. We start talking about flood zones. I've got a number of slides here that are extremely heartbreaking. Um, I myself have, have had to do uh, uh, presidential declarations on uh, dozens and dozens of uh, terrible, terrible floods. Some of the floods in the last year and a half um, really are great indicators of the flood risk that we want you to understand when you go into EarthX. What we're seeing now from the flooding instances are, are unique, uh, but not unique because they're not gonna happen again. They're unique because they're becoming very crystal points on the map of this is what you've gotta be prepared for. Uh, Germany earlier this year, the bottom line is places that have been around for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years flooded to a level that they've never seen before. Well, how does that happen? Well, part of it is the geography of the location. Part of it though, and probably the bigger part, is how much water is coming down all at one time. The sheer amount of water falling from the sky. And that's what happened on uh, July 14th. The R River swelled up, uh, it surrounded that community, and it basically took nearly all the houses off their foundations and jammed them all together. Those houses in this picture are not normally configured like you see them. And unfortunately, a lot of people died. This is actually a, a map of this particular area. They put about 3,500 people in shelters. Um, these were floods that people hadn't seen in, in, in over 500 years. They exceeded the 500 uh, year floodplain estimate 
but many people said these were thousand year floods. The problem is we're seeing around the world 500 year floods back to back. What does that mean? It means that we've got to be prepared for what's about to happen. Um, at least 50 people died initially, 1,300 were missing. I did a little quick update on this slide last night and actually uh, at least 199 people died and there's still 300 people that are unaccounted for. Tremendous loss of life in a country that has a history of being able to deal with flooding and understands flooding, built on a riverine uh, basis, but still uh, lots of loss of life, lots of damage to infrastructure. I don't want you to get the, th the, the feeling that we're only looking at uh, the, uh, the developed world. Sao Paulo flooding earlier this year, 30 people are missing, large death toll, whole, whole villages wiped off the face of the map, the mountainsides came down, uh, which is one of the big issues. And uh, bottom line is what little infrastructure they had has been completely obliterated and it really is like stepping back into the stone age. Then we talk about some of our great friends in, in the UK, and these are pictures from this year's flooding in England. Uh, if you'll notice the, if you, the picture on the upper right, uh, that is actually the second story of those buildings. That's not the ground floor, that's the second story. Uh, just tremendous uh, rise of water. The rivers came out of their banks uh, and uh, put, up, put people in tremendous jeopardy. The headlines were like the one that I captured here just because I thought it was, was an interesting way to state this issue. At first it was the floods, then it got tremendously hot, and then it flooded again. That is exactly the scenario that we're seeing around the world. Uh, we've got a relatively stable weather pattern. We see the, we see the temperature of the atmosphere heat up, a cold front clashes with it. It then, it then drops an atmospheric river of water on a relatively small geographic area. It cannot absorb that water, and all of it once you've got flooding at historic levels. Uh, in this particular uh, slide, you'll notice it dumped a month's worth of rain in just a few hours. The same thing that happened to Baton Rouge a few years ago. The same thing that's happened uh, in the Southeast several times now, and it's beginning to happen uh, around the world where we've got small geographic areas with just a tremendous amount of water in a short amount of time. The second terrible, terrible flooding uh, event that happened right behind Germany was the flood in China earlier this year. Uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer here because the original information was only that there was about 100 people, uh, which is a terrible number, uh, but a little bit of trying to hedge, hedge the, the information flow. Uh, what actually happened though is more than 300 people died. But what, what killed them was the floods and the mudslides because China had also had a series of devastating fires previously. So the floods triggered the mudslides and anybody that was below ground and near one of those areas, you either got flooded and died underneath uh, in trapped buildings, uh, basements, or they, the mudslides took out the building and they were left in it. A uh, tremendous number of vehicles damaged. I'll show you a slide that's almost mind boggling. But what we talked about was over eight inches of rain in one hour. Uh, I want you to think about that if you get a chance, if you're not familiar, if you can't figure out what eight inches of rain looks like, go grab a, a, a ruler and then think about that all over the town that you live in. You end up with uh, pictures like the bottom on this one where just everything is flooded. Those are actually roads in case you do, can't tell it. That's not a river, those are roads that are flooded to that level. What China's come online and done here in the last couple of months is they've, they've pulled back on some of the, the mystery behind what happened. And uh, they're becoming a voice of reason for climate change, which has been something that has not always been the case. Um, you, you'll notice here that they're, they're pretty clear. These things are being caused by high temperatures and heavy rainfall, and it's all because of climate risk. And we've got to find some way to deal with this climate risk. And through EarthX, we think we're gonna give you a chance. This is the slide that I just could not leave out. Uh, this is where they took the more than 400,000 cars that got flooded out. Now, hopefully they don't show up on the used car market and you buy one. But I want you to think about 400,000 cars uh, that all got flooded. Um, I saw this slide. I knew I just had to include it because it's, it's all inspiring. It's a, huge, it's a huge environmental disaster. Every one of those cars had oil and gas in it. 
Uh, these weren't cars on a car lot. These weren't manufacturing cars. These were cars that were in the countryside. 400,000. And now let's talk about the kind of the soup of today, right? Hurricane Ida, uh, more than a million without power in Louisiana. This was not something that we didn't see coming. Um, this was not what I'm describing as one of these atmospheric rivers. However, if you check the statistics, the, 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 no, the level of energy that's in the last, several, last couple of years, hurricane seasons, is off the charts. It's not that we haven't had major disastrous hurricanes in the past, but we're seeing them more often with more moisture, with more wind speed um, than we've ever thought about coming on land. And when that happens, infrastructure so far has not been built to withstand this. Uh, but I'm going to give some props out in this as well. Um, one of the things I want everybody to understand, because as you're getting ready to play EarthX over the next two months, we're going to give you the ability to experience cross-sector injects, maybe at a level that you've never played before or been exposed to before. That's because we're real believers that if you want to be prepared, you need to understand what can happen in the areas around you. What can happen that can make you change your plans? If you look at this slide, all the red 50 pluses, uh, that's where the power is out at a substantial level. Um, it, it's scary, but it was predictable. Uh, however, when you start thinking about cascading failures, people think, well, the power is out and the power will come back. Uh, if you've been part of our, our Black Sky planning effort or any of the EarthX webinars, you, you know that it's unrealistic to think that the power is going to come back in 24 hours after a Black Sky event. I was a little chagrined today as I listened to some of the, the national news media try to pepper um, uh, both our national leaderships and the state leadership, local leadership, and then the energy providers asking why the power was still off. Um, it, it's really good that I don't have the ability to reach through the television set and touch people because I probably would have done what we call in the military headspace and timing them. When you lose major portions of the electric grid, uh, when, we, when I say major portions, I'm talking about the transmission network, uh, the transmission system, or the generation system. Uh, those are those are weeks uh, in, to put together and re-engineer. So we need to be thinking about that the power is going to be off for a while. Uh, we don't like to think months, but the reality is it may take a month to get the last house back on. But what you've got to be prepared for is the loss of the other systems that are powered by the, our electric grid. So, you know, we've got more than 300,000 without water. That number is probably very low. Uh, more than 300,000 that are that do have some level of water, but they're in boil water. Uh, interesting thing about boil water, if you don't have electricity, boiling water is pretty tough to pull off. It, it can be done. There are other ways to boil water. But for most people that depend on electricity, that's the first thing they, they go, why do I can't have electricity? Uh, very interesting to note, though, if you talk about damage to uh, the ecosphere and to potentially humans, 80 out of 84 sewer pumping stations lost power uh, when the storm hit or immediately following. One of the things that was great, though, that was done by Energy was they realized that that was an issue and working together with local communities, they were able to get uh, backup generation units on site for those pumping stations fairly quickly. Not 100%, but they did a great job of moving quickly. Uh, one of the things that we always talk about from the, the, the council standpoint is one of the most important things that's got to come back is you've got to get the ability to communicate back online. Uh, we all know that cell towers went down uh, across the region. However, our cell providers have been uh, very responsive. They've moved in a number of uh, cellular on wheels and other solutions. So communications is getting a little bit better across the impacted region. Not perfect, but to get things back to where they were, uh, we're basically looking at another re-engineering effort where fiber optic cables were pulled down and destroyed. Uh, you know, fiber does not bend well. It, it, you would think it would, but uh, if you can't get too much, then you can't you can't pass light. And then a number of the network hub locations were were destroyed or damaged heavily. Uh, the bottom line, though, the real issue for this area, if you just want a little more peek at what happened, eight transmission lines went out of service. That is a tremendous number of transmission lines to lose all in one area. And one of those was actually a, a transmission line that crossed the Mississippi River. And uh, anybody who's done any kind of level of engineering effort for electricity systems will tell you that's not something you're going to put back very quickly. 
So alternate routes, alternate sources for generation, uh, but they will get there. I've been amazingly impressed with, uh, uh, with Energy's uh, poise under this situation. Uh, they've got a great track record and they've done a good job. So my hat's off to everybody that's working that response. Uh, we just need to keep all the responders and the people working to bring uh, all the systems back online uh, in our thoughts because they're gonna need all the resources and support we can get them. We swing back around to China. I wanna kind of end the, the flooding piece on this one point. These disasters that we're talking about are happening in the middle of what we started with, which is the COVID uh, pandemic. And with the Delta variant and the, the ease of transmission uh, of Delta puts a whole new level of strain on our systems. And we need to keep that in mind. And those of you all that are thinking through EarthX, uh, think about how your plans might change or would change if you had to execute those during this COVID period. Obviously, I don't, I don't think you'll be able to let that go far from your mind, uh, but we have seen where uh, some of these events have ended up being super spreader events uh, because someone in the population uh, was impacted. I wanna swing around and talk about some of these other issues that we touched on uh, briefly and I kind of move a little quicker at this point. Uh, the impact from extreme heat. We do not have to have fires to have problems. With the, uh, with the change in climate, what we're seeing is that we're warming up extremely quickly. Um, and some of the things that are a little bit odd is where we're warming up. Uh, you would ordinarily not think of Canada warming up very fast. Canada has warmed up extremely quickly. In, in the past, we always thought that the night was a period of cooling off. Um, it still is, but what's going on is that the nights are warming up even faster than the days. The days have already gotten blisteringly hot, uh, but the nights, are, the nights are warming up at twice the rate. What does that mean? Well, that means that the days are going to get even hotter because without that cooling off period, we're going to look at more and more extreme situations. What the chart is trying to show you is um, the, the rise in the number of deaths from heat uh, around the world. Well, in this particular chart, the U.S., but uh, there are similar charts that will show you that this is not occurring just in the United States. Uh, this is occurring all around the globe, including Siberia. This ends up being life-threatening. Um, when you've got 33 million people under a heat alert, uh, you're gonna have people die. It's just the nature of, of the situation. And uh, in late June, more than 600 people died in, in this, this, the heat wave of 2021. Uh, that's three times what the estimates were. If you're an emergency or community planner, you've got to think about how are we going to deal with this new threat of extreme heat? And what we're seeing is these heats, these heat systems don't dissipate very quickly. They tend to last for several days to several weeks. These particular charts, and again, you may not be able to read all this, but I'll, the charts will come out with the slide deck. Um, these are the peaks. This was in Washington state. Um, and you look at the baseline numbers and then see what happens. Extremely scary, extremely scary events. This is Oregon, another event. Oregon, I, when I think of Oregon, I always think of green, cool, uh, wet. And remained wet, but it got really, really hot. And so these are things that around the globe, you've got to start thinking about happening in a community near you. This late uh, June heat wave, if you'll notice this map, really centered farther north than we we would have anticipated it using projections from previous years. Uh, so this, this gives you an idea that you've got to start working it into your own planning processes. Uh, I live in the northernmost southern state, uh, and we have routinely gone over uh, the 100 degree mark, which is unusual for us this year. Uh, but we know that we've got to have the plans in place to deal with this. But if you go to the Southwest, uh, California is a bellwether. If you come out of the Southwest in Nevada, Utah, uh, you've got to be prepared for these events. The thing that's also going along with these heat waves that you could expect is this idea of this mega drought. Uh, this, is a, this headline just gripped me when I saw it. I thought I'd share it with you. This was uh, an earlier, this particular map on the left was uh, July 20. I want you to look at Minnesota on that map. Minnesota kind of right dead center in the United States up there by the Great Lakes. I had a, had a great uh, opportunity to do a Boundary Waters canoe trip uh, a little over a decade ago. Uh, Minnesota was not a place that I would have ever predicted to have a drought. 
It's it's got more lakes than almost any other state. Uh, but this slide on the right is of about just a few days ago, and this is uh, large chunks of Minnesota, especially in the north, with uh, an extreme drought condition going on. So if we can have a drought in Minnesota, I really don't care where you live, you got to be prepared for it. This is a slide I used in uh, several of the EarthX prep, and I, I like this slide because it shows a couple of different things going on. This term earlier this year was the first time I'd ever heard this term, the idea of a mega drought. And that's what we've got going on in the southwest of the United States. But as I just mentioned, it's, it's slowly moving out of the southwest. And what we've got on the right uh, is that particular uh, Lake Powell. Um, I've actually been there when the water was all the way up to the brown areas. And if you notice dead center in the middle, that's a marina. That marina used to sit in the middle of that lake, not near the landmass at all. And uh, I don't know how long it'll be, but pretty soon it's going to be on the lake bottom. This is a projection map that I wanted you all to see. Part of my job with EarthX is to get people to look towards the future and do the kinds of preparedness actions that they can take on now before it, it really does become too late. Uh, originally, when somebody said 2030, that was going to be about 20 years in the future. 2030 is nine years from now. Uh, very scary map if you look at all the places that are red. Um, my friends in the UK, I want you to kind of zone in there. Uh, you guys have got some drought uh, situations coming your way as well. But all over North America, parts of South America, obviously Africa, and of course I've got friends down in Australia and they've been dealing with their own version of droughts and wildfires for the last three or four years. Uh, don't do this to scare you, I do this so that you take everything seriously and just get ready. The flip side of this is we've been talking about floods, um, but in some places there's just not enough potable water, uh, potable being uh, drinkable water. Uh, apparently and, and globally, there are more than 1.42 billion people, uh, including 450 million children that are, are water insecure. They get their water from surface water. If you don't know what that means, that means a runoff or uh, uh, water that's collected when it rains, if it does rain, or unimproved sources, which means it's not been filtered, uh, or uh, water that they have to walk more than 30 minutes to collect your water. And that's the case for a lot of places in, in Africa and some in South America. Why do we care about that? Well, these droughts in this water condition is going to impact every single one of us. We are all going to be impacted in, the, in, the, in our wallets. Uh, but more importantly, we may be impacted by the, the amount of food that's actually being able to be grown. Um, there are solutions for this, but they're not cheap. They're not inexpensive. And a lot of countries aren't ready to do those. My friends in Israel will tell you that uh, water desalination is, is one of the keys that, that can and should be used. But the bottom line is, uh, based off what we've seen over the last two years, there are going to be shortages uh, in water and food and they very well could lead to the kind of political and social strife that none of us want to see. And so experts are telling us, we don't get a handle on this, we are going to have food problems. Another major issue that's going on is this this information problem that we've got where we can't trust the information that's being uh, circulated. And some of these are extremely problematic. I'm not going to read any of these to you. What I'll tell you with is just kind of a capstone. I collected all these in the last 30 days. And that's just the, that's the top of the issue. Misinformation is something that you've got to be prepared to deal with and it will show up in EarthX. So be prepared to check things. The other issue that's acerbating our solutions is, is this idea of ransomware, which has turned into a complete global threat. If you played EarthX last year, you know we did an entire exercise on uh, cyber. If you didn't get a chance to play that one, check back with us. The cyber exercise is being relaunched. Uh, we're going to rebrand re it. But there are three major ransomware attacks out there, the Ryuk, the Cerber, and the Samsung, Sam Sam. And if you look at the numbers of people that have been attacked in 20 and 21, it's astronomical. The question I want to I want to pose to everybody is, would you even know if you've been hacked? Maybe even more importantly, do you know if your primary partners have been hacked? Has your community been hacked? Is, is your community leadership been hacked? Is your financial institution hacked? We don't know. They're not gonna tell you. The odds are though, they're vulnerable. 
if you wonder why we're concerned about this from a council standpoint, look at the uptrend on this. The amount of attacks uh, is, is literally becoming something that, that, that is conceptually hard to get your brain wrapped around. What has to happen to hit these kind of timelines is systems are getting patched and then getting rehacked. We're talking about 10 times more ransomware attacks um, this year than what we saw previously. And sooner or later, they're going to get in the door. The truth is, if, you, if, you, if you're following this, they are getting in the door on a regular basis, and they're bringing some operations to their knees. The big threat that we worry about from the cancel standpoint is uh, the hacking of our critical infrastructure. So what does all that mean? Well, one of the things that we learned and we talked about uh, last year and we continue to focus on is the impact of the supply chain. You got three competing things that are hitting us this year on supply chain. Obviously, COVID, we, we began the dialogue and discussing that uh, with the pandemic uh, about what it showed us where we couldn't get masks, we couldn't get certain uh, pharmaceuticals. What we've seen also coming out of China this year was the number of manufacturing sites that were impacted by the devastating flooding. But what's also showing up now is this terrible impact on the transportation uh, networks, which are getting stressed uh, more and more and more. And if you read the headline at the top, What's it mean to us? It means there's going to be shortages and it means we're all going to pay more money. I pulled one example of supply chain fragility forward for you to think about. And this is one that's been in the news for the last 18 months or give or take. And that has to do with the chip shortage. Our world is in a, uh, turns on the information economy these days. And right now, if you go to buy a car or a computer, they are more expensive now than they need to be. And there may be difficult to find because the chips are just not there for, the, for manufacturing to complete the assembly. Uh, there are places close to where I live where there are entire acres of trucks waiting for the chipset to come in so the truck can actually be moved forward. A lot of this was, was happened in the 2000 when uh, Apple and other manufacturers went to, uh, went to Taiwan to outsource chip manufacturing. Uh, the, the, the biggest a manufacturer, the, the manufacturing juggernaut there, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, you'll, you'll see it written TSMC, uh, over, over, worth over half a trillion dollars, um, tremendous amount of intellectual capital. Um, uh, calling them a juggernaut is probably being as nice as you can. But what have we seen happen uh, to try to solve this? Well, Intel has invested billions of dollars in two new plants in the United States to start trying to deal with this, but they they readily admit they are way behind on getting this done. So this is going to continue for at least another 18 months, uh, but we've got to solve this problem. But it's just one of the supply chain issues. The other supply chain issue that I brought forward was just to give you a picture of it. If you remember earlier this year, we had uh, uh, we had the uh, um, the barge. Uh, get stuck in the Suez Canal and from wherever I could not get my brain, how could you possibly do that? And then I saw the pictures. That's the size of the barge at the bottom. Uh, basically a, 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 a very poor job uh, of uh, steering the barge through the canal. Uh, but the bottom line is it backed everything up for, for weeks and weeks. And it talked about that uh, it could, you know, it, the impact on small and medium sized companies may go on for eight to 12 months. Um, just a tremendous issue. We are we don't have a tremendous number of shipping lanes, and the Suez Canal is one of the ways we've kept costs down. But we got to do a better job at managing this. So that's that's kind of a quick recap of the bad news. Um, the good news is there are some things where we're headed in a better a better direction. So I want to spend a few moments before we get out of here talking about this. Uh, climate change. It's not all bad news. It is pretty horrible, but it's not all bad. We've got a number of organizations. In fact, there's over 36 organizations that are working collaboratively to help solve different aspects of climate change. But what we got to do is limit global warming. Um, the debate's over with, as I mentioned. We got to find a way to bring down the gases in the atmosphere. Um, good news is the US has agreed to uh, try to do something by the end of this decade. Hopefully that's fast enough. Only time will tell. It's really tough to, to uh, to make these kind of changes in a short amount of time. But the adage that we had until 2050, uh, the last climate change report by the UN says we don't have that long. Um, the good news is uh, the infrastructure package that's making its way through Congress 
uh, and we're not the only country doing that, uh, is really embracing funding for cleaner versions of electricity, uh, public trans transit, and electric vehicles. But we are going to need improved battery technology to, to really maximize that, and that's coming along. Uh, the new batteries have a, a much more capacity and a longer life than the other batteries that we had, we built the, the green energy movement on. And the new the other great piece of news is uh, renewables are coming on like gangbusters. Yes, we're going to leave some industries in the background, uh, but they have to go back. Uh, we can't continue to burn fossil fuels at the rate we have been. We're probably always going to need a surge capacity uh, to be able to pull ourselves forward in case we need to do black start. Uh, but eventually I'm hopeful that we will we'll be able to accomplish that as well. But uh, it, we've got to have these technologies come on quickly. I'm, I'm somewhat uh, uh, pleased with what I'm seeing in the emergency preparedness and especially community and state emergency management. And I, and I, I will leave international and federal in the, in the picture too. Uh, FEMA's done a, a good job in the last couple of disasters really trying to, to bring uh, the right kind of information to bear. But where I'm really, really pleased with is what I'm seeing in, in a lot of communities where they're starting to gravitate towards addressing the systemic, systemic risk. They're doing some, some great proactive evacuation planning. Uh, my partner, Ranger, will on a bad day will tell you that they're still not good enough and they're making mistakes continually. Uh, but I'm, I'm hopeful that you all are gonna seize the opportunity in EarthX and uh, really, really figure out what your community needs to do to be ready to evacuate. I'm seeing improved planning and preparedness and in EarthX, we're gonna give you a chance to really think about the planning effort for restoration. Well, I'm also seeing dealing with a lot of uh, national leadership groups, uh, NGA, Nehru, uh, NEMA, um, not to leave any of the in groups out, they're all, they're all, I'm seeing great things from all of them. But senior leaders are paying attention to these issues where maybe 20 years ago, it was something they just hoped never happened. And then I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about just the tremendous, tremendous work being done uh, by NEMA and our mutual aid uh, communities that are really bringing people to bear for Ida, but not just Ida. We're moving firefighters all the way across the world to support fires in the Western part of the United States. Uh, we brought uh, search and rescue in from Israel for Miami earlier this year. Uh, mutual aid and EMAC has got it going on. We just need to continue to get better at it. One of the things that I'm most passionate about individually is this idea of, of trying to end uh, hunger, uh, world hunger. It's, it's where I put my own time and some of my own resources. Uh, we've got some great, great organizations that are working internationally, uh, the World Food Program, uh, the Care Network, uh, and the Hunger Project uh, are really putting the kind of right resources and planning and capabilities together. So look for them and look for others and see what you can do to help. Uh, this is not something that one group's gonna solve the, the world hunger problem, but uh, we do have the resources to do it. Now we just have to demonstrate the will and the caring. This is one that I'm, I'm you know, I, I put this on as good news because uh, there is some good news, but at the end I'll tell you a little not so great news. Uh, we gotta figure out cyber crime. Uh, cyber crime is, is the bane of our existence. It seems like it's running uh, just totally amok. Uh, there are a number of groups that are working to uh, to really try to take on some of the, the truly ugly portions of this. Uh, when you start talking about communities losing their own resources to, uh, to cyber threat, uh, that's a horrible thing. Those are tax dollars going for things that they shouldn't. Uh, but then we've got child exploitation going on across the dark web. Uh, and then we see that uh, the deep web is the source for a lot of different tools that really are nefarious and have no reason to exist in the modern world. Um, the fact that they continue to exist is, is one of the things that I'm not happy about. Uh, but I do see groups uh, in, in modern governments, uh, collaborative governments like Australia, Canada, Japan, uh, Norway, the United Kingdom, the USA, a handful of others that are trying to work together and are sharing information. The problem is there are a number on the other side that really are fostering this kind of stuff too. Um, this slide I put on here uh, for, for maybe to get some of you all to maybe go take a look at it. This whole idea of working with law enforcement, the, the heart of what I wanted to say on this was the way we're gonna solve this is by partnering. Um, no one organization, no one piece of software, no one network tweak is gonna solve cyber crime. 
Uh, it is it is going to have to be an evolving culture that con consistently works to get better. And that all starts by sharing solutions and sharing information. Very pumped up about what the ISACs are doing. Uh, we're blessed in the U.S. and I know we work with our, our, uh, our partners around the world to share that information. Uh, but if you get a chance, um, CISA is doing a super job on this and they're working with uh, a number of great partners. And so remember where you can partner so that you're not trying to do this all on your own. The other thing that's got to happen is we need smarter people and we're probably not going to get smarter people by working with people at my age. I'm kind of at the end of this game. Uh, started in computers before there actually were networks. Um, what I'm excited about is that we're starting to teach some of these, these critical uh, concepts to younger and younger groups. Uh, and the idea of defining and protecting what will end up being a collective digital right bill that the world can ascribe to, where we build the kind of protection mechanisms in there, and we've got the kind of vetted platforms where people can trust the information that they're getting. Is this whole idea of, of misinformation, I put it right up there with, with the, the digital cyber threat. Um, uh, from a guy who's got a military background, I'm very concerned about our, our adversary's ability to wage war. So I'm gonna jump into my last little slide here there. I hope you've enjoyed some of this discussion. What I wanna talk about now is EarthX. EarthX this year is an extreme impact event. So when you, when you suit up, when you boot up, when you strap on, uh, go into EarthX realizing we're not tossing you, we're not tossing you the spring flood, uh, and we're not tossing you the uh, the one house house fire. We're talking about an extreme set of events. So when you go into EarthX this year, uh, I want you to understand that you're going into some serious situations and some extreme conditions. That's by design. You won't learn anything if we just toss you the kind of events that you really don't need our help getting to. We focus on black sky. Um, I pulled out climate change driven disasters because at the end of last year, when I looked around the world, these were the ones that were kicking our, our uh, collective rear ends everywhere I turned. Uh, a couple of recommendations. One, you get your link. Uh, your link will go live tomorrow. Actually, it'll go live very late tonight in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, boot it up, uh, test drive it, see how it fits together, be comfortable with it so that when you go into play it, you're focusing on playing the exercise. Uh, there is something we've added this year called the interactive uh, evacuation game. Uh, this is for fun. Uh, it will it will make you think. It will definitely entertain you. It's it's part of our uh, it's a product from our creative team that writes uh, the EarthX uh, videos and shoots them in Hollywood. Uh, but I want you to picture yourself in that scenario uh, and just think through it. You'll get the chance to play a little bit before you actually jump into EarthX the exercise. You'll get a chance to play it again at the end of phase one. Same thing in phase two. Once you've knocked it out and played it, it doesn't change past that. So you only need to play it once, uh, but uh, enjoy it. Uh, but put, picture yourself in that situation, learn what you can learn. Um, that fourth bullet, what's a region? This has come back to me from my team. We write EarthX to be played around the world. So we define a region a little bit differently. A region is whatever drives the exercise forward for you. If it helps you to think of a FEMA region or a geographic region in the UK or Canada or anywhere else in the globe, it, it's someplace where there are a number of communities grouped together. Uh, you could also think of it uh, as a region within a state. The important part's not understanding exactly what region we're talking about, it's to understand that we're talking about a, a geographic place on the ground. We can't get more specific than that because we don't know where you are. So we left it very generic, make it work for you, customize the injects for your particular environment. EarthX is very much a tabletop exercise in that, you know, I, I'm often saying it's not a lights and sirens exercise. We don't ask you to, to run out in the, and boot up or uh, do any of that kind of stuff. We want you to read the scenarios, read the material, really put yourself in the scenario where we've got you, and then think your way through it. Have discussions prioritize your thoughts, and then put your best responses into um, the tool. The Battle Rhythm Manager is easy to use. I personally would recommend constructing your response in a word processor and cut and pasting it back into the Battle Rhythm. But if you don't want to do that, however you want to do it, we'll take it. Uh, we do really appreciate people that spell correctly. So that's why I use the word processor. Um, but uh, we really are kind of wanting to know what you think. We use what you give us to help build the next exercise. Um, 
involve your team. We've got some people that are really doing some cool, cool, cool things this year. Uh, I think this really started with InfraGuard two years ago when Mary Lasky uh, pulled together a team and they played nationally. And then we've seen it in, uh, in California in a couple of locations, especially uh, Cal OES. Uh, but this year, I, I can't talk more about what Lauren Wisniewski and uh, John Organic are doing with the uh, EPA and the water sector. Uh, they're, they're playing as a team. They're running it across three different days for discussion. I, I love it. Do more of it. I've been contacted by InfraGuard. In fact, I've got a call with them later today to talk about another approach that they want to try this year. If you're interested in developing a unique approach for your community, your team, uh, your family, shoot Ranger and I an email and we will get back with you and help you figure out how to do it. We want you to make the most out of this free opportunity. The only sin is not playing. Uh, we do ask, uh, unashamedly, share, help us and spread the word. If you enjoyed EarthX, uh, put it on your social media, uh, write your friends, involve your network, get the word out to more people. Um, I think I mentioned this earlier, but we had 41 countries register to play last year, uh, and over 12,000 participants. Uh, we'd like to beat that this year. We, My personal goal, and we're not going to get there, but my personal goal is every single person in the world that has access to a computer and needs to play EarthX. I want you all to survive and thrive. Bottom line is to have fun though. Uh, while it is challenging, it will make your head hurt a little bit. It is pretty cool to do a virtual exercise, realizing you're getting a chance to learn these things in, uh, in, a, in a virtual world and not have to learn them like many of our friends are down in Louisiana and Mississippi today and around the world struggling with some of these terrible events that are ongoing. And then my last comment here is, there will be a document coming out tonight. It'll go into the directory. We'll probably email it also to everybody that's already registered. Uh, and it'll say, read me first. And it'll have some late breaking information. Nothing that'll change the exercise, but some things that uh, links and things that may make it uh, beneficial to have in your hands. But as always, you don't have to do anything to get ready for EarthX other than uh, register and show up and play. Finally, my last slide. Thanks for you all sticking around for, it looks like I'm a little over here by a couple minutes. Um, wanted to do this in much less time, but the more I got into it, just could not shrink some of these issues down. Um, that's how you can reach both Ranger and I and the entire EarthX team uh, at that email address. The one thing to remember it is a .org, EarthX at EISCouncil.org. We, we routinely get people writing to us and we like to help people solve their problems. Um, so feel free to do that. I'd encourage you to join a work group if you're not part of one. You can join one of our work groups. We're kicking off our work group activity again uh, in some of our critical uh, areas, including critical infrastructure, uh, state emergency management, private sector, and the health and medical communities. If you're interested in being part of those discussion groups, shoot me an email. I'll hook you up with our uh, sector coordinators. Uh, help us expand the team. And then finally, uh, there's the registration link. If by chance you got here and you haven't registered, Cool, well, I'm glad you made this, but uh, register and uh, bring your friends. And with that, I'm going to uh, I'm going to give you back the remainder of your afternoon or wherever you are if it's morning. Uh, be safe out there though. Uh, I feel kind of bad that I got to say this again this year, but wear your mask, uh, get your shot and stay well. And we look forward to getting your responses to our fix. Everybody take care. <laughs>